Okay, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Rich Sauls. This is Tim Hudson. We're here to talk about OpenSSL after Heartbleed. Lower the volume a little. Okay. Anyone still got eardrums? Um, okay. We promise. Um, so, first of all, the OpenSSL team is meeting face to face all week um, here, partially funded by the Linux Foundation, the core infrastructure initiative. Uh, we have an open session uh, for anyone who wants to come and talk to about it. Uh, porting issues, bugs, introduce themselves at the end of the day today in one of the last sessions. Um, so, we'll just get started. This is, we promise, the last talk where we'll ever mention Heartbleed. Okay? Um, but we think there are some really interesting and useful lessons for open source development. Um, OpenSSL certainly learned a lot and improved a lot. Um, so, just get right into it. Uh, how many people recognize this date? And this was, yeah, this was the rekey the internet date. Um, it's when Heartbleed came out. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, it means that ever since April 2014, every defect, every security bug had to have a logo, had to have its own website, right? Um, we saw some really great drawings internally for like Poodle. Shell shock. There was an open OCSP one that had this rocket ship crashing to the earth and so on. Um, so what it means now is security researchers obviously have to have somebody with some kind of artistic sense as, as part of their team. Um, but it did really uh, it changed the world. Um, having short, understandable names for things are very useful. You can say, "Am I susceptible to heart bleed?" And everyone knows what it is. Um, if someone says, am I susceptible to CVE 2014-1744? Gee, I don't know. I, you know. I don't memorize strings of numbers like that. I don't think most people do either. Uh, Heartbleed was the first real security defect, um, or first real general internal facility, internal uh, component defect that caught mainstream press. Um, Daily Mirror, English tabloid. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know who Reva's mom is, um, and I think she's fallen off the radar. Um, but Heartbleed will be known for a very, very long time. It showed up on the, you know, the front pages of tabloids. It showed up on front pages of major websites. Um, hopefully, we'll even outlast the Kardashians. We'll see. Um, bugs get. You know, defects get cartoons now, and this is actually a really very interesting one. It was a very simple bug. Um, the cartoon explained it in simple, easy to understand words. You said, give me ship, and, here's a, and give me 20 bytes back, and it just gave you the first 20 bytes that it had, right? So as a result, it was a way for an attacker to read remote memory. Um, what you got back was sometimes interesting, generally boring, but it could include, depending on how the memory was used, uh, sessions, data, private key information, things like that. Uh, one CDN, not mine, uh, said, oh, we're not susceptible to heart bleed. We put up a server, try it. And I think within two hours, they had recovered the private key. Just by, you know. It's, it goes back to the really old days of the computer hobbyist uh, era, where people would just do peek and poke at random memory locations to see what happened. And so this was all peaking. Um, so if you're a security researcher um, looking at issues, you have to find the basic thing, you have to write it up. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, it puts more pressure on projects to fix bugs. Uh, it's also a bad thing because it puts more pressure on projects to fix bugs. Um, transparency is good. Um, but it's an interesting question, you know, why did this one hit media so hard? Um, in the intervening time frame, we've seen millions and millions of accounts stolen, right? And which is sort of the worst thing that could happen with Heartbleed. Um, it doesn't seem to get the same level of coverage. Maybe it's just because it happens so often it's not news anymore. So one of, one of the things that's interesting to look at is, is effectively um, how, how many catastrophic bugs do occur? Is Heartbleed unusual? When's the next heart bleed going to occur? Um, and we, we've just got a summary of a few, few of the different CVEs up here. 
in terms of major impacts, major issues. So it's not just Heartbleed that's out there. Why was Heartbleed so important, so special? And, and frankly, you know, my parents don't pay much attention to technology, but they knew about Heartbleed and they asked about it. And you know, everybody knew because it had a logo. It was in the newspapers. Yeah, in, in Australia, it didn't make the front page of the standard press, but it was in the, the technical news for sure. And there's a lot of bugs that are out there that, that are incredibly serious, that have an impact. And one of the things that we do is we have a look at the nature of what the bug is. Yeah, what is its impact? How exploitable is it? What's its overall score? What's its rating? And when you turn around and compare things like Heartbleed to some of the other, at the, the time, relatively contemporaneous um, issues that occurred, you can see Heartbleed doesn't sort of rate all that high as an overall score. Yeah, go to fail, and you look at the RSA signature uh, forgery issue, it was highly exploitable. So why did Heartbleed capture so much attention? And that's one of the things that, w that we have as a, a project team has sort of looked at. You know, why was this one special? Because we don't really want more of that sort of special in future. So we've had to take a, a more detailed look at not just the technical issues, but what caused it, what, what did it lead into? So what, what actually happened? So it's a pretty simple bug. Um, there was a validation check. There was a variable that contained a length. Um, the, the code was contributed into the tree. Um, the bug had been in OpenSSL for three years. Three years is a, a fairly long time for, for a bug to be in existence. Now, it's certainly not the longest bug. Um, the project team member that checked the code and didn't notice the bug. None of the other team members saw it. Um, external security reviewers kind of sailed right on by. Um, all of the external users didn't notice it. Um, the security reviews that do occur in the major organisations kind of completely bypassed them. One thing that was really important is all of the existing tools that you run for static code analysis, none of them reported Heartbleed. Now, three days after Heartbleed was announced, they all report Heartbleed. But you know, at the time, it just was completely missed. And one of the, the more interesting aspects of this particular bug is, is it not only allowed clients to attack servers to recover memory, but it operated in the opposite direction. A server had the ability to reach back through and look at a client's memory. And that's interesting in a whole pile of context because the client's usually operating in a very different environment. So you're sitting in your corporate environment with lots of stuff going on, reaching out through however many firewalls, well, this is coming backwards to enable a, a, a memory read issue to occur. So there was a lot of aspects in it that were quite interesting as, as a bug. Um, so yeah, as a bug, it was pretty small. Um, this is the, you know, the Git repo statistics. 600 lines added, 20 taken away. Um, a large portion of those lines added were the, open, the old OpenSSL copyright. Mm -hmm. um, or it was done by a graduate student um, to do, uh, the intent was to measure the maximum transit unit for T, uh, DTLS. Um, arguably, it was an OpenSSL bug that also added it to TLS support. If it was in DTLS, nobody may have ever noticed it because not many people use DTLS. We're having an ongoing discussion about how important, impactful that is. Um, but it was a very small amount of code, and the, and the commits were always public. Um, people were looking at things, and you know, many, what's the phrase, many eyes make all bugs shallow, but only if they're open. Um, and so Heartbleed did have the advantage, at least for open a cell, of opening everybody's eyes. Um, so why were they <laughs> closed before? Uh, the project was snoozing, <laughs> to put it politely. Um, it had become more bound. Um, releases weren't announced. Uh, the policies were like, oh, we're putting out a new release. We think this is the best one ever. Everybody should upgrade. Um, oh, we found, a, we found a vulnerability. Everybody should upgrade. There was no ability to plan. There was no recognition that major organizations that were repackaging or including OpenSSL or building products on OpenSSL needed time, you know. We now look when we're scheduling releases. Well, we could do it Thursday, 
or Friday, but that means the IT staffs of IBM, Red Hat, you know, they're going to have to come in over the weekend. So maybe let's wait until Monday unless we have a really pressing need. Things weren't pre-announced, they weren't pre-scheduled, there was no documentation. The source code was complex and arcane. Uh, anybody who looked at the old SSLEAY and OpenSSL code, um, it made things like proc mail look pretty. Uh, it was complex, it was arcane. Uh, the curly braces were positioned in a way I've never seen before. Um, everything was done through tables of function pointers. And that's okay, perhaps, if you're implementing a state machine. But if you're implementing code to just keep track of errors, and again, go through a table of function pointers, that's probably not the best way. Um, just have an error mechanism. Have a thread mechanism that uses the native system capabilities. Don't, don't allow people to switch these things out at runtime. Uh, it was hard to maintain because of all those features that led up beforehand. The code was really hard to read. It was opaque. Um, there were almost no comments. Um, there's still almost no comments, but at least two people have looked at the code and someone says, put a comment here. And we do have lots of comments that have been added purely because of code review, where someone says, I don't understand this. And so it was commented. It was harder to contribute. Uh, if you were in the US, it was kind of impossible to contribute because of stupid US regulations. Um, the team was spread across Europe, um, loosely affiliated. It was hard to get code in. Once you submitted a code or a patch, a code patch or a, a bug report, there was no guarantee as to when anybody would ever get around to looking at it. There was no policy as to when anyone would get around to looking at it. Um, the main developers uh, were overworked and overcommitted. Uh, at the time of Heartbleed, there were basically two developers. Um, you know, barely making enough money to live. Um, and they were doing it not on mainline OpenSSL, but they had to go outside for other funding that we'll talk about shortly. Donations were minimal. I mean, this was an open source project that barely got $2,000 a year to keep going. And even if you're living in, you know, a nice European state with lots of support systems, it's still hard to not, you know, to move into a place and do OpenSSL. Um, people were pounding on you, throwing, throwing patches at you, throwing code over at you, screaming and yelling because their bugs didn't get fixed. Um, because it was just, as I said, two guys who were very, very overcommitted, or two and a half guys, or two, three guys, depending on how you counted it. Looking at some GitHub stats um, for the two years prior to, uh, prior, um, to Heartbleed. Um, so it's the period there in the, in the gray box. Um, these are the two top committers, uh, Steve Henson and Andy, whose name I can, still can't pronounce very well, so I won't. Um, the next nearest committer had 100 people less, 100 commits less. So when I say it was two people running this, barely eking out a living, this is true. And this was the platform used for what was called e-commerce at the time. Now we just call it the internet, right? Um, it was severely underfunded, under-resourced, and over-committed. And two people were doing all of the work. There were a bunch of people knocking at the door trying to help, trying to contribute, trying to commit, but they didn't even have the bandwidth to take on that additional work. So how do we let this happen? There's a number of ways. And I can talk about, when I say we, um, I wasn't part of the team then. So it's how did they let this happen? But that sounds a little too adversarial. Uh, very little time was spent on building the community. Um, the mailing lists were maintained using this old system major domo. No one even had the chance to go fix that up. Um, it was hard to search archives. Uh, people would just people using the source, source would comment on mailing list. Very few times, the developers would have very few times to be, to be able to respond. It took a really long time to understand the code. It still takes more time than we'd like, but that's a problem when you're writing complex cryptographic code in C. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, the project membership was static. It had not changed. Um, there was a wariness about involving other people. Certainly nobody from the US could be involved. Um, it was hard to get socialized and get to know other people, so it was, um, it was static. Um, 
there was a strong need to focus on consulting dollars. Um, the major project that brought in consulting dollars was doing a FIPS certification. FIPS is a U.S. government standard checkbox item for selling into major parts of the government or other organizations that follow the U.S. FIPS standard. Um, and that had to keep the project alive. It had to keep the people fed. It's reasonable. Because of all of those pressures, as I said before, we could not make, announce, or even keep any plans. We could say, yeah, we'll put out a release next month. Didn't do it. We still, at least now, we can make plans. We announce them. We're pretty good at keeping them. We slipped this last release by, I think, three months, but that's overall not too bad. But all of these things, all of the concerns about involvement, uh, inability to bring on other people, inability to look beyond the next day, made a very ultra, and, and the personalities too, also played a part, frankly, all added up to a very, very ultra cautious, scared, if you will, um, of any kind of change. Right? So it was, it was stuck in this little bubble. Everybody depended on it. Very few people knew about it. And it was there isolated. And the, the easiest way to, to not break things is don't change them. So if you, you make changes infrequent, you reduce the problems for yourself. And it's, it's sort of human nature to, if you, if you have a problem and you can see a simple way of reducing it, you tend to take that, especially when you're overworked and frankly rather underpaid. So one of the things that happened post Heartbleed, and this is a kind of sanitised version of some of the feedback, um, most of the feedback that came into the project was, was highly negative. It's like, you guys must be completely, totally, totally incompetent. How could you ever let this happen? You know, how could I trust you with you know, my toaster in future, let alone you know, e-commerce on an internet level? So it, it's interesting when you're, you're receiving this sort of feedback when in order to fix the problem, you need to be able to focus on what the actual problem is to address it, and you're getting all of this <laughs> negative feedback coming in. Um, yeah. A, a very common question was, well, you know, how many more heart bleeds are there going to be? You know, when's the next one coming? And you know, anybody who turns around and, and says, you know, my, my open source project is defect free and we'll never have a security issue, um, they, they're kidding you because people write code, people make mistakes. There will be more bugs. Now, we're doing what we can to reduce the likelihood, but you can never eliminate the possibility of a security bug. Um, so, you know, the question is, how many more heart bleeds are there? You know, what, why didn't the project notice us? Why was it asleep for three years? Um, we often got a, a, a lot of feedback as people were realising, well, you know, I'm impacted by Heartbleed. I've got all of this software that uses OpenSSL that I never knew beforehand used OpenSSL. Why, why aren't the people who are like making all this money off OpenSSL contributing? Um, how can we trust anybody that makes such a big mistake ever again? What do we do about this? You know, why don't I just go and find somebody who's not those guys and use them as well? And there, there are a lot of the, the feedback that came into the project. Um, some of those discussions got, got pretty personal, pretty focused, uh, and pretty difficult for some of the team members to deal with. And they're all good questions to ask. You know, it's an open environment. It's an open source project. If anybody's got a viewpoint on it, you know, you're free to express it. If you don't like what the project team is doing, it's open source. Fork it. Go your own path. Follow your own direction see what you can do to achieve. And that's one of the benefits of it being such an open source project and widely available. So what happened? Well, Heartbleed was a wake up to the industry. And you know, those commercial companies that were effectively getting a free ride on OpenSSL did wake up to the, the impact it was having in terms of we need to do something about this. We can't be relying on a couple of guys who are poorly funded for such a critical piece of, of infrastructure. So the Linux, Linux Foundation set up the Core Infrastructure Initiative and effectively got a, a group of a dozen or so commercial companies together to be able to offer funding for not only OpenSSL, but other critical projects that are under-resourced. Let's reduce the likelihood of you know, people working on a project like this where there's, there's so much work to be done and so little funding, let, let's get more infrastructure, more support, more ability to turn around and address the issues so that saner processes can be followed, more eyes can look at the code. Um, there's less likelihood to turn around and say, hey, I'm so busy I can't stop to think. You want to actually have that capability. And it's one of the things that the Core Infrastructure Initiative has actually done for OpenSSL. So is this you, it's still you. 
Still me. Okay. So where, where were we prior to Heartbleed? So prior to, to April 2014, as, as Rich has already said, there were effectively two main developers. Now, don't get me wrong. The OpenSSL team was bigger than two people, but two people were doing most of the heavy lifting. Um, it was all volunteers. Um, nobody was funded by a large corporation to work on the project. And in fact, as, as Rich has already men mentioned, most of the funding came through on consulting work. Um, the decision-making process, and the, there was one, but it wasn't particularly formal. So as of December 2014, so we're looking you know, six months after Heartbleed, um, there's 15 project team members. Um, there's two people who are fully funded by the Core Infrastructure Initiative to work on OpenSSL as their day job. And there's two people who are funded to work full-time based on the donations that came in from people who were concerned. You know, here's this, this project, I see it's got a problem, how can I help? Can I contribute money? I may not be able to contribute code, I may not be a security person, I may not even be a developer, but I'd like this problem to be fixed. Oh, it's just money? Here, income donations. So that sort of thing has, has helped a lot. And with a, a bigger team, of course, you need more processes in place. We have a very formal decision-making process for the team. And you know, it, it might surprise folks to realise, you know, get 15 people together, you don't get 15 people agreeing on everything. You have to have a mechanism for making a decision. And we've got a pretty simple one within the team. Uh, one of the things I just want to mention about the CII that I found very, still find very interesting um, is one of the initial founders and sponsors of it was Microsoft um, because they recognized that if the internet goes down because people can't rely on it and it's not secure, that they're going to go down too. Um, so it's not just the usual IBM, Red Hat, Oracle, you know, standard open source vendors. Microsoft has also become more open source friendly, obviously, in the past two years, but it's people who depended on the internet, the next rounding of sponsors is probably going to be people like banks and other organizations, you know, grow the, grow the CII. Um, okay, so one of the things we had um, that immediately came out is after the team was grown, two years ago in Frankfurt, we had our first face-to-face -face meeting ever. Um, there's a picture. Uh, in, in Dusseldorf. In du sorry, Dusseldorf, you're right. There's quite a difference between the two cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all German. I'm an American. It's just Germany, right? How do I know? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but it, it, it was really critical um, because it's really important to know your colleagues. Uh, you really have to work. If, if you've worked remotely versus in an office, you can understand some of that. Um, if you see these people every day, you occasionally go out to lunch, you go out for beers at the end of the day, um, you sit there and work on the Poodle CVE fix during the day and then go out and drink afterwards. It's a great team building exercise, right? It's a lot better than trust walks or camp outs and things like that. But socializing really helped us get a, a good level of comfort with each other. And so, for example, it also makes code reviews better. When someone posts code on the internal team and then someone else reviews it, you know that they are just, you know, it's not that Andy hates me. He's pointing out that, no, it's kind of a stupid mistake to assume Perl works this way. And I don't take it personally as much. Um, at that face-to-face, -face, we drafted several of the major policies that are still uh, in use. We still follow them for the most part. We're in the process of refreshing them. A release strategy. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, a security policy, how we know when um, security defects, how we categorize security defects, what consumers and other downstream users of OpenSSL need to know when we say it's a moderate defect. If it's a low defect, it's just going to show up in the source base, people may or may not care. If it's a high defect, okay, get your IT team ready. If it's one of the things we learned after, um, is we need something worse than high, we need a like, you know, severe or critical, rekey the internet. Um, so for the first couple of releases after Heartbleed, um, the press, and Twitter, and all the other social media, they all panic. Oh my God, it's another OpenSSL release. No, it's okay, it's not that bad. We haven't had one that bad since. So far we've been lucky and good. Um, we may again but at least people will have the right expectation now. Oh, it's another release, don't panic. Oh, okay, it's just yet another set of security fixes. And we've actually gotten pretty good marks from folks who appreciate our openness, um, our over-eagerness at times to say, yep, that's a vulnerability, here's a CVE assignment for it. 
Um, and again, the openness in the process um, and the pre-notification systems we use. Trans all of this is related to transparency. Um, looking at some of the core problems before, it was insular and opaque to the outside world. Now it's just the data structures that are opaque. Um, we use GitHub for many things. Uh, pull requests. People make pull requests all the time. People open up issues all the time. We are still figuring out how to do it. Um, when is something an issue versus when should it be discussed on the mailing list? It's an educational process for the team and for the community. Um, <clears throat> we have public policies and security fixes, a release schedule, high level content. Here's what's going in the release. Oh, look, we put out beta releases, alpha releases, so that people could try to test things. Um, it's worked reasonably well. Some people have tested it. Many more are doing it now. We have the code of conduct. You know, don't be an ass. Uh, and so on. Uh, the email traffic has increased. I think it definitely seems to be more useful. Um, there are other members of the community now contributing answers to questions. Um, the members of the team are responding more quickly and rapidly. Um, we seem to be more engaged and having a, a more virtuous cycle of feedback. Security fixes. Uh, this comes from a blog posting by team member Emilia Casper. Um, it shows, you know, the red or the high fixes, high security things, and how many days it's been it took us to fix all of these things. Um, every issue, although some of them have taken longer than we like, people's bandwidth is is consumed. Um, we haven't had anything slip to you know the 90 days. Severe vulnerability fixes get fixed within you know two to three weeks. There's a pre-notification scheme that all the downstream distros get to see it ahead of time. So we've been very, very good. We'll probably do an update on this one you know, at the end of this year, um, hopefully, because uh, this only goes up to, uh, you know, whatever it is, 2015. Um, we set a goal, and we, we were able to meet it. Um, and we take, as a security and crypto toolkit, obviously security is really important, and we think that reflects, our behavior reflects that. What's happened this year? Um, I was preparing some stats for a report for the core infrastructure initiative. Uh, 3,200, 3,300 commits, um, all done you know, through Git. Every Git commit on our internal repository gets you know, immediately pushed out to uh, GitHub. Uh, we've had one major release, 15 bug fixes. I think that's now 17 because the bug fixes had bugs. Uh, oops, obviously we still have a ways to go on some of those things. 29 CVEs were addressed. The GitHub activity, um, 280 people contributed um, unique logins, uh, 122 issues. And that was just in the first 10 months, of the, nine months of this year. I didn't go look before you know, 2016. Uh, 63 pull requests were added. Um, we closed 900 issues, 970 issues, almost 1,000, which is mind-boggling to me. We closed and almost all of them were merges. Sometimes things were rejected or sometimes submitters closed it. There was the occasional joke, there was the occasional joke PR, oh, migrate to boring and here's a diff, you know. But most of the PRs were accepted and taken on by the team and 730 pull requests from GitHub. Uh, I think that shows an amazing amount of community involvement. So continuing on from, from what Rich is saying, if you, you turn around and have a look at the left-hand side here, this is you know, effectively in the lead up to, to Hartley, what was going on before the team refreshed itself and, and took a hard look. And if you have a look at the, the activities on the right-hand side, and this was leading up until the beginning of this year, you can see that the, the mix of committers has changed. The, the details are, are, are moving along fine. Um, you can see new faces in there, new team members being major committers. There's more committing going on by different people, there's more review, there's more interaction. There's actually more of a sense of community. So not just is the, the project team itself doing more work because there's more people, the community interaction is, is radically increased. The amount of, of work that's going on, the dialogue, the feel of the project team and the feel of the community of users has radically altered from, you know, pre-heart bleed through until now. 
And one of the things that, that's you know, made a difference is we, we had a huge number of historical issues raised in the, the defect tracking system we were using. And you see the, the issues there in blue, that's the issues closed. In red, that's the issues remaining open. And effectively, this is at the point in time where things start changing. That's there are new team members. There are people that have the ability to turn around and start going through those issues. And a substantial portion of the issues that were sitting in logged against OpenSSL, they were issues that had actually been fixed much earlier. But nobody had had the time to look to see that the issue was fixed to be able to close the issue. So a lot of cleanup work went through just going through, oh, OK, the status is out of date, or this is something that makes no sense, but nobody had any time to look at it and say, this makes no sense to do. Or that's a good idea, but it's superseded because the code's moved in a different direction since this issue was logged seven years ago. So those, those are the types of things that we've had to go through as, as a team and just look at what's there. Um, we found that we're getting a lot better at looking at a defect and analysing it and saying whether or not it's something that needs to be dealt with. So the time between a defect goes in and some project team member has a look at it is greatly reduced. And that, that, that can only be a good thing in an open source project in terms of if you don't look at the reports that are coming in from your user base, there's no way you're going to know what's going on out there in the community. And by getting that feedback and paying attention to it, you become less cautious about being willing to make a change. This might break something for somebody, but that's okay, we'll have a dialogue with them. So it's all right to turn around and, and look at improving the code in ways that may have an impact on the users when the users are in a dialogue with you and you're communicating. Um, so uh, one of the, yeah, as Tim said, the dialogue is, is, is crucial. It also means if people report bugs and they don't get a response, um, they stop reporting bugs. So things just sort of lay there hidden. Uh, we are not, frankly, at where we promised we would be. We said all, everything would get a response or a review within four days. It's probably three times that, but at least it's you know within a couple of weeks. The supported releases, this is on our website. Uh, 110 is going to support it until the end of September in uh, 2018. We've put out our first long-term support release that will get only you know bug fixes, security fixes, no new features added. Um, the numbering criteria, we will probably stick with it, but it's a little awkward, right? The, the one, the initial one could probably go away and we could just have, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So we had uh, support for, you know, 098 is no longer supported, 100 is no longer supported, and 101 uh, support ends at the end of the year. Um, we're only doing security fixes. That lets us focus on the things that are in use by most people. Um, and working on keeping the project vital and adding new sets of features. Um, one of the things about being responsive is people then start to uh, look at your stuff more, and that's really good. Uh, I had Kenny Patterson, who you know, discovered all the problems with RC4, says, you know, for about a year there, you could get tenure if you just wrote a paper about a security defect in OpenSSL. Um, that's good and bad, right? Um, at any rate, um, people are doing more fuzz testing. The, the, um, the bar has been raised, right? Just as crypto, you now have to have constant time implementations, even for remote network remote stuff. Um, you now have to do fuzz testing, continuous integration builds. All of that stuff is OpenSSL is doing. Um, we're working with Software Testing Lab in Oregon, who had this interesting technology about mutations where they modify the compiler, so they flip around statements, and if your test doesn't find it, that means you don't have a test to cover this particular branch of code. So we're, we're on the, the cutting edge. The static code analysis tools, as Tim mentioned, within a week, everybody had upgraded to catch this kind of thing. Uh, we use Coverity as part of all of our builds, uh, part of all of our releases. Our defects are, I don't know, 0 0.2 is the number. Um, report issues are more quickly analyzed. And the biggest change is everything gets read by at least two team members. You know, the person who wrote it and somebody else. We are not where we want to be on code reviews. We could be better. Um, many of them are like, yeah, I don't know Perl, but I trust you. Or, I don't know System, 3, I don't know System Z assembler. Yeah, if IBM said it's fine, good. Um, 
sometimes it's like, oh, you need a white, you need white space here, and they're more about the formatting. But we're trying to really dig in more. We recognize the need to dig in more on code reviews. Um, that also comes from more familiarity and comfort level with each other. Um, but it's a major tool for improving our code and improving the people writing the code ourselves. Project Roadmap, we published it. It's here. We have, we're working on all of these things. We're doing a refresh of it. So by next week, we'll have an update, set of updates to the website. We are trying to be honest and frank, forthright. Um, yeah, we didn't do this. We'll try to get better at it. Yeah, you know, saying we're going to document every API. There's 2,400 of them to be documented. We're going to focus on this one set. We'll leave 2,000 of them alone for now. So we're trying to set expectations appropriately. The increased vitality is its own reward. We have about 1,100 forks on GitHub. Uh, it's too many to display. That's why it says can't load the network graph. Um, we have people like you know, Daniel Sternberg of Curl saying, I found a bug. You fixed it in 15 minutes, and I can keep moving forward with my port. So that's a great, you know, nice set of testimonials. Future plans. Uh, 15 minutes left, good. Um, these are the things that we know we want to do. Uh, TLS 1.3. Uh, if you've been to the IETF, I, OpenSSL is notable by its absence. The timing just didn't work. We were busy with the 1.1.0 release. So TLS 1.3 is certainly high on the list of the things to put in the next release. We have stated publicly uh, we want to move the licensing to Apache v2. We've been working on that. Uh, people from the Software Freedom Law Center have been helping with us. That will happen in due time. Uh, I wouldn't put a timetable on that. More testing. We integrate fuzz testing. We've gotten donations of uh, system images from Amazon to do you know, more continuous fuzz building. Um, there's probably other things that are needed. Um, and then FIPS is very important to a large section of our users. Uh, and Tim can talk about that. Yeah, so one of the things that's historically kept the OpenSSL project alive, and certainly the, the, the couple of developers working pre, pre Heartbleed, was the importance of, of having a FIPS 140 validation for US government use, or people selling into US government. And FIPS and the work associated with it and the validation process itself um, is effectively what provided the funding that kept OpenSSL available. So without the funding that was coming from the FIPS activities, you know, the, the guys working on OpenSSL would have not been able to make a living at all. So it became pretty important. Um, there's, it's, a, it's a very time consuming and frankly irritating process to go through. And there's a couple of team members here who will quite happily talk to you at length over uh, a, a cold beer at just how irritating it is. There's uh, lots of stories around that. But it's something that for an open source project is incredibly difficult when you've got a, a set of requirements you have to meet over a lengthy period. So we're talking a couple of years for a validation and generally it's sufficiently expensive. You've got to coordinate it between multiple sponsors, then somebody's got to keep the sponsors happy, figure out what the different objectives are and make sure everybody's happy that the end result, which you hope eventually comes out with FIPS validation, meets the overall requirements. So a lot of work has gone into that and it's something that's incredibly important to a substantial portion of the OpenSSL user base. So to give you an idea, you know, a lot of people turn around and think, oh, FIPS validation, that was work. You, like, you did it once and boom, it's all finished. And like, you know, that work happened three, four years ago. What, why are you still talking about it? Well, this is just a summary of all of the updates on the current module. So every one of these lines is a whole pile of work that was done an update that had to happen. The module is being continuously maintained and updated and change letters are being done against it, requirements are being checked. It's not something that's static. And every one of these activities that you go through here involves a whole pile of time and effort. There's a commercial organisation that wants something done, you've got to talk to them, you've got to figure out the terms and conditions. There's testing work that has to occur, you've got to engage a FIPS lab. A whole pile of process has to be gone through just to turn around and keep the module alive and available. So this is just for the existing module that's sitting there and not the other modules that used to exist. So next, next slide, Rich. So 
We've got the FIPS 2.0 module, and that's for the OpenSSL 1.0x series. Um, the 1.0 module, if you're using it, well, you shouldn't be because it's no longer useful. There is a new FIPS validation project underway. And uh, we have a company, SafeLogic, that is, has agreed to provide the funding for that, and it will be a multi-year journey. So it's not going to turn around and be, hey, six months from now, there'll be a FIPS release for the 1.1 series. It's something that's going to take a pile of time. And a lot of the work that we did in, in making the data structures opaque in 1.1 should enable us to make the meeting of the FIPS requirements less um, intrusive in terms of the overall solution. So that's a whole pile of work that's going on. It's, it's a big chunk of work that's separately funded. And we're going to see how that pans out over the next 6, 12, 18 months. But it's one of the things where we, we know we have to do a better job of not having any requirements that come in from a FIPS validation impact the, the project team or the module or the mainline code base in any way that sort of perturbs the more general use. And that's something that I think you know, this next module is going to be a lot better in terms of how it can handle those, those sorts of things. And you know, one of the flipping off the FIPS top, topic back to you know, what, what have we actually learned? Yeah, what has the Heartbleed experience meant for the project team for OpenSSL as a whole? Um, doesn't matter how good any one person is, nobody should be relied on to perform superhuman feats, to you know, review code, look after a, a large user community, you know, work crazy hours, and not make any mistakes. So if you're, you're relying on one individual to, to be you know, the best that is possible, you're ultimately going to be disappointed because we're all human. We make mistakes. I make mistakes. Um, if you're doing code reviews, you've actually got to make sure you're looking at the code. And you've got to look at it in detail. So when you know what a bug is, finding it is easy. When you don't know what it is, it takes time to sit down and review. And hoping that your user community will review the code for you certainly doesn't work. And relying on automated tools because you haven't got the humans to spend the time doing reviewing also doesn't work. So you've basically got to go back to using experienced people to go through and perform detailed code reviews, and that takes time. Okay, so um, as we're approaching the end, so how to contribute, how to help OpenSSL help you make your stuff more secure. Um, download the pre-releases, or which is now be download the release. Uh, build your applications. Uh, one of the team members works on Debian. I think we had one third of the 500 packages that use it converted over. Um, think of this as future proofing your code. The fact that you can no longer look inside what's in an RSA struct or an SSL struct and play around with those fields. Um, I speak from direct experience of my daytime employer who said, oh, look, here's an SSL context. Let me add 17 variables to it to control what I want. Um, by not being able to do that and forced to use the existing extension mechanisms, you'll be much happier in the future. When the next release comes out, you can just, no matter what it is, drop in the new shared library, and things should just work much more cleanly and have much more chance of success. It's a two-way street. Uh, join the virtuous circle. As we have, and the team has become more responsive, uh, people have been contributing more. As people contribute more, others join in. So we get this feedback loop in a positive sense. Um, as a minimum, there's mailing lists, OpenSSL dev for development of the project itself, OpenSSL users for people trying to do things with the package. Um, submit, I was going to say, report bugs through RT. Maybe not. We're looking at RT with a drawn to eye these days. Uh, submit patches on GitHub. Help close bugs. Uh, to submit patches, as a reminder, we want a license agreement. We, we're not taking, as of now, we're not taking anything that doesn't have a license agreement signed so that we can convert over to Apache um, without having to undo your code or rewrite the code. We know, we don't know as much as we'd like to about our user community. For example, yeah, sure, people build command lines and, you know, Apache, Nginx, all the other web servers use it. That's certainly a major use. It's not the only use. So if you're using TLS for th other things, DNSSEC, uh, DPRIV, 
um, things like that. We'd like to know about it. We'd like to hear from you. Note to the OpenSSL users mailing list. Mail to the OpenSSL team saying, hey, I'm doing this kind of stuff. If you're downstream of OpenSSL and you are a major internet company or a major distro, you know, get in touch so that we can discuss futures and plans all open in an open forum. But we're trying to reach out and understand more how, you know, how what we do affects people. Um, there's a community page on the website, www.openssl.org. Uh, and we can, you know, enc I encourage everyone, or we encourage everyone to look at that, contribute, write docs, write bugs, build it on, well, I was going to say build it on other platforms, but we may not care too much about that. Uh, before we go into the questions, should we you want to make them stand? <laughs> so most of the OpenSSL development team is here. Um, you guys want to just stand up and wave or something? Come on. Uh, yeah, thank you. We'll be here all week, as, this, as the joke goes. Um, so, we so, so feel free to you know, stop anybody who's in the team and ask any questions. It's one, one of the reasons we're, we're here is to be able to interact with the user community. Right. And, and hopefully there's no more heartbleed questions. Hopefully we've now closed that chapter and moved forward in, in a better way. Um, in a more productive way and more useful way. So the team members are here, uh, country affiliation, uh, whether or not they're attending and so on, uh, and who the funding is. So we have about three, four minutes left, so we're glad to take any questions you might have. Yeah, I... We, we, we can repeat the question. We'll, if you yeah, yeah. yeah, just, yeah. Co-op, say that, cooperative? Co-op. Oh, co-op. Co co okay. Okay. The other, my question was about Apache 2 relicensing. Um, because Apache 2 is incompatible with the LV2. Yeah. So what, what is exactly the exact question? Okay, so the question was, why are we doing Apache 2 since it's incompatible with GPL? Apache 2 has patent protection. And unfortunately, in the crypto world, it's rife with patents, and the team thinks that that's important. We've also joined the Open Invention Network for defense, um, but particularly with the Lipta curve emerging as the soon-to-be dominant crypto, and we see people, company, you know, mobile phone companies in Canada suing other people. We just think it's real important. It's unfortunate that. You know, we'll, we'll point to the Apache page where they say, we don't think it's incompatible, but, GP, but FSF, FSF does. We have to respect their rights. Um, it's better than it was, but yeah. Any chance of just doing dual licensing? Any chance of doing dual licensing? No. We, we've f pretty firmly decided it's going to be Apache. The choice was, yeah, we've had a lot of discussion. We've gone around with the Software Freedom Law Center. Um, run by Eben Moglin, and the advice from there, too, is also do Apache. Thanks. Yeah, it, I, we know it doesn't please everybody. Anyone else? Yeah. How did you restart your community? How did we restart the community? Um, I, 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 think, I think everybody within the team realized that, that something needed to change. And it, it's effectively by gathering a greater pool of people who could work on what was going on and being transparent with the community. You know, dirty laundry out there. This is what happened. This is what went wrong. This is why. This is what we're doing to fix it. It actually began a dialogue with the user base. Now, frankly, Hartley could have led to everybody saying, OpenSSL sucks. I never want to use it again. But I, I think it was the original team members at that point in time, the response that they took to say, right, we're going to open up the team, we're going to make it larger, we're going to address these long-standing issues, I think has led to a real positive feedback from the OpenSSL community itself. Yeah, I think it, I, I joined after Heartbleed. Um, and I know internally we had discussions about, oh, please don't make me work with those so-and-so's from OpenBSD, right? Um, I think being honest and admitting what was obvious to everybody um, and saying, yeah, okay, we're trying to get better and just being responsive, that's a big thing. If, somebody, if, you, if people see that what they comment or what they 
issue is a, a diff gets responded to, then they're more likely to get engaged. The light refreshes on the website and the mailing list infrastructure helps, but it's really about seeing that the communication is a two-way street. Yeah. And, and occasionally folks will open a, a pull request on GitHub and get one team member saying, hey, I like what you're doing, and another team member saying, I don't agree. Being open in that dialogue, we, we're not one organism that has a single viewpoint. We're a pile of, of developers with very different backgrounds and very different views. But we've got a way to work together as a team that improves a pretty critical piece of infrastructure for everybody. Yeah, we could probably have made a sitcom out of the discussions on where we put the curly braces. Uh, when we were deciding the coding style, I mean, like Tim said, we had a process and there were votes. And what about this set of indent flags and what about that set of indent flags? I mean, these were all experienced C developers and so 10 people had 12 opinions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think the general opinion on the coding style was not what's currently there. That was yeah. the consensus. <laughs> Anything but that. <laughs> What's the relationship? Okay, the relationship with people like Libra. So there were two major forks that came out of OpenSSL. One is really, Libra is much closer, whereas Boring is headed off in their own direction more. Um, they were good, kind of surprising. Um, they get pre-notifications. They have helped improve patches for security things. They still have to, you know, they say, yeah, sorry, we gotta make fun of you guys because that's how we, you know, rile up our base to get money but we don't take it personally. There have been mistakes made. I was going to say on both sides, but on their side, we forgive them. Yeah, so, whatever. So it's good. So we collaborate. Not, not always has it been good, but there is an active dialogue, and I think that's a, a good result. Yes. And again, you know, if another fork turns up for a community that wants to head in a different direction, then you know, we as a project team, we just recognise anybody can fork the code. That's something that you've just got to respect, that there is a community that feels it's important to do something different. And you can't ignore them. They're, they're, yeah. Libra SSL is part of the open SSL user base. Yep. So yeah, we get along well. You were talking about, um, say, things that we've done externally, but did you have to do some internal re-architecting or refactoring the code? As I said, there were some weird types of indentations, kind of bit falls, which, which developers can find. Did you have to re-architect or refactor the code internally? Um, so we, we, we actually re received um, external audit advice. So an audit was performed on the code base that basically said, here's the areas we think you need to think about restructuring. So if you have a look in the 110 code base, you'll find a lot of the record structure processing has been completely redesigned, completely re-implemented. Um, there's a pile of areas where we think we know we need to do some more work in this this area, and we're being upfront about it. We, we think we're going to change this. We don't like how this is handled. Um, we're going through and yeah, more constification. We're looking at some patches to, to get S size T all the way through the, the code base. There's a lot of stuff along those lines that by having more people looking at it, we can identify areas that we think need additional attention. So we're certainly doing that. Part of taking all of the data structures opaque is to give us more flexibility to re-architect without breaking everybody's code every single release. Yeah, I mean, I'm already excited. 1.1.0 was good, but like the stuff that's in master, you know, go to that now, man. It's, it's much better. We've got one way down yeah. the back. Uh, bug bounties, have you ever considered those? Have, have we ever considered bug bounties? Uh, no. Not that we've considered it and said no, but we've never actively considered it. I don't think we've ever had sufficient funding to consider spending some of it yeah. on bug bounties. And, and frankly, finding a defect in OpenSSL, you know, you get, that's, publicity's your credit. There are other people who do bug bounties, um, and people have reported things to us and say, can I now claim a bounty? It, that's up to them. Um, but, you know, finding a bug in our error page on the web server, that doesn't count. And that's what most of them tend to be. I think we're beyond yeah, time. Right. So uh, thank you for your time. Feel free to approach anyone on the team during the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.